it just looked beautiful. I wanted it to be part of my story. He was introduced to me as the coach and he said, anything you need, let me know. I was a 17 year old girl at an all girls school and I was getting complimented. I was on my back with my knee to my chest and he was like lunging over the top of me. Do the parents of the children that are sending their kids to private institutions know that they are not mandatory reporters? That's not an easy thing to look at, but you have to look at it, you have to be honest about it. We need to open up the doors, open up the windows, find out what's really going on. No one told me what to do after your rape because I never thought I would be. It's definitely a branding. Emma Willard has made a brand name for themselves and the image that they portray is like a very self-assured woman who is educated and bright and yeah. I think the biggest characteristic that is common for Emma girls is that they are confident. On a snowy day in the late 90s, then 17-year-old Kat Sullivan visited Emma Willard for the first time. The all-girls private high school is known for its academics. Its alumni include women's activists Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand, and actress Jane Fonda. She was hooked almost immediately. I think that we want them to feel like they belong, that they are cared for, and particularly in a boarding school, when we have parents that are perhaps three hours by um, plane away, or in fact they're on the other side of the globe. Kat grew up in a middle class family, first going to school in Dallas, Texas, before moving to Atlanta, Georgia for the first few years of high school. Visiting Emma Willard and New York was something new to her. For me, coming from Atlanta, um, there was way more snow than I had seen and it, and it had been untouched. And looking out at the snow under the lanterns with like the gothic architecture, it was beautiful. It just looked beautiful. Um, I wanted it to be part of my story. What she didn't know was things would soon go off course and this would be a chapter that would define her. I played on my old school in Georgia's um, boys soccer team and I played um, junior varsity as well as varsity. So I was actually introduced to Scott Sargent when I was touring the school. He was introduced to me as the coach and he said, you know, anything you need, let me know. So that was my first interaction with him. Scott Sargent worked at Emma Willard since 1994. Besides a soccer coach, he was also a history teacher and was often seen with other students. Kat was beginning to adjust to school and things were going well. And I was just walking to the pharmacy, which is about a mile away from the school, and a car honked on the side of the road. And then I heard my name. And you know, when I turned to the side, um, he's like, get in the car before you break your leg. So in the car, you know, he's like, what are you doing out here by yourself? And he really just seemed like he was trying to help me. Scott and Kat spent the afternoon running errands. When he dropped her off, he left her with a gift. And he said, um, hey, wait, wait, before you go, take this CD, listen to it, let me know what you think, and then um, think about like coming over with some of your friends and have pizza. You know, like that way you can make some friends and I'll rent a movie at Blockbuster. Scott's interest in Cat grew, finding secret ways to correspond. I had never seen AOL instant message in my life. So I was sitting at the computer, responding to my dad, and a little like box popped up and I kept getting messages and I'm like, who is this? And they're like, ah, just secret admirer. And I'm like, okay. I would say like the flirtation started there. You know, they said, you looked really pretty today. I'm like, do you, like, how do you know who I am? They're like, oh, you know me, you'll, you'll find out. Soon after meeting Scott, Kat was faced with a devastating family emergency. We'd received a phone call that my mom had brain cancer and my father was trying to communicate with me and I wasn't able to reach him. So I was lost in the hallways a little bit. I was frustrated. I don't cry often, but I was really frustrated and tears were going to start falling. Scott found her in the hall and offered his support and access to his office where she could feel safe. And he actually took a key off the keychain. And before I left that office, he said, you know, don't tell anybody, but yeah, if you need to reach out to your parents, just use this anytime. Just be careful like coming and going because I shouldn't have given you a key. 
I've gone to private schools my whole life, and there have been plenty of teachers that have been kind of like older cousins, if you want to look at it that way, where there's clearly a boundary, um, but it was okay to have a friendship. Kat says Scott slowly manipulated his way into her life, even crossing boundaries. At some point, it went from complimenting me to an arm over the shoulder to, oh, your hair looks nice today. And all of those things felt really good. And then, honestly, he invited me into his office after dinner one night. He's like, I just want to talk to you. And when I went into the office, the lights were out, which I expected because I thought I was the first one there. I was trying to be very quiet because security. And I closed the door and he said, I'm in here. And I, I almost like screamed because I was not expecting the lights to be out and him sitting in the chair in his office. So he had actually moved one of the chairs in his room so that I'd be sitting next to him. You know, he leaned forward and he started to kiss me. He became more aggressive senior year. He was very interested in any sexual experiences that I had had. His emails very quickly became demands. Kat spent the summer before senior year with friends, acting like a normal teen. But she says Scott continued to show interest when she returned to school that fall. It was soccer season. And so it started with um, him helping me stretch a hamstring with everyone else on the team watching. I, it was literally like I was on my back with my knee to my chest and he was like lunging over the top of me. I was horrified because that put his pelvis like directly above my pelvis. And people kind of noticed. He became more aggressive senior year. I had turned 18 over the summer. I don't know if that had anything to do with it because um, it was then not statutory rape in New York. But his emails very quickly became sort of demands of what his expectations of me were. And then it started being, how about you just come and wear your hair in a ponytail? It looks nice in a ponytail. Those little suggestions of behavior or mannerisms or expectation of dress, um, he started to insert them. Scott lived on campus, but he didn't always. The privilege was revoked by school officials after they became aware he was in a relationship with a recent Emma Willard graduate. But officials let him back on campus before Cat enrolled in school. Cat visited his apartment, and their friendship developed into a relationship, which she says became sexual. I will tell you, I remember very distinctly, um, jumping forward a bit, where he showed me porn for the first time. And photographs would come up of young girls in compromised positions. There was bondage that he showed me, not initially. And that's the grooming process, is just making minor changes, um, easing his way in. I literally don't know why, when I was uncomfortable and not wanting to do something, that I did not say, I don't want to talk about this, or you know what, I'm leaving. They would communicate secretly by email, but Scott began to send so many messages, they overwhelmed her. He was messaging me four or five times a day, and a lot, like pages worth. And I didn't understand all the things he was talking about. I didn't want to sit there and read it in front of anyone. And so I printed it on a printer. And that way I could look at them in private because I didn't want somebody looking over my shoulders because they were starting to become very sadistic and hypersexual. And I was embarrassed by them. So I wanted to print them and like go somewhere else. Cat couldn't keep up. And she says that made Scott furious. It was harassment. It was distracting me from schoolwork, it was distracting me from friends. I had to like skip meals to be able to get through all of the, the writings that he was sending me. One day, a malfunction caused one of the messages to print after Kat left the computer lab. Those emails were found by several students and brought to the assistant of school at the time. It was shortly before a spring trip that Scott was chaperoning. Kat was called in for a meeting. And she said, you know, I just, you know, there's younger students on those trips and because it is a school trip, 
Um, I've made the decision to remove him as a chaperone. You're still going on the trip, and then um, please just be more discreet about how you print emails or your communication with him. And with that, she gave me back the emails, and I left the office mortified. I stopped eating. I stopped going to the cafeteria because I felt like everyone knew and everyone was staring at me. Kat says Scott was furious after that meeting and told her to come to his apartment. That was the first time that he had wanted to tie my hands behind my back um, or, you know, above my head or in a way that I couldn't use them. Um, and then he tied my legs. Um, and he took a lot of effort to do that. And I was actually in a really uncomfortable position. And he just kept telling me to be quiet, you know, hush. And then um, I started to really freak out because now I, he actually had put um, a gag in my mouth and um, blindfolded me. And I was, I was starting to freak out. And he actually got very close to my ear. And he said, it'll be fine, don't you trust me? I was immobilized. I tried to fight against it and couldn't get out of the position. Um, until he was done. I don't remember after that. I don't remember even seeing him. I think he just kind of untied me and then he went wherever he went and then I was left to, to hurry back to my room. That was the last time Kat saw Scott Sargent, but it's not the last time she'd hear of him. After leaving his apartment, she received a phone call from a former student Scott had a relationship with. She called Kat a joke and said she should kill herself if she didn't, she was going to do it for her. Kat's life began to spiral out of control. I was on my way to the science lab to swallow chemicals because those were going to be how I was going to end my life because uh, everything was just gone. When Kat reached the science lab, the door was locked. There was a teacher in the hall who said everyone was looking for her. The question started, you know, what's happening? We know everything, tell us everything. When I told them what happened to me, um, I wasn't looking for sympathy. I needed help. I told them, I, I think I'm really hurt. Did they not have any instinct to just take the precaution and send a police officer by to just check what's going on? They don't dispute what I report happened. What they are disputing is that I said it was rape. What they do not say is that I did not report to them that I was bound and, and gagged and anally raped. Those administrators gave Kat the $200 she would have spent on her spring trip. With nowhere to go and only that money, Kat relocated to New Orleans, knowing a friend in the area. Scott stayed at Emma Willard for another year, still employed as a teacher and coach. The new administration at Emma Willard today says they're very disturbed by the culture that existed at the time. I remember being agitated and just wanting everything about Emma Willard to go away. I didn't want to know anything about Emma Willard anymore. I didn't want to know anything about the school. I didn't want Scott Sargent to know where I was. I mean, I was devastated. I didn't want to talk to my parents. You know, the school had told me they were disgusted with me. My father's a hardcore Catholic, and so I had not been on a date. Um, so certainly having sexual relations with a teacher was not something that my father would have been thrilled with. But Kat says Emma Willard didn't tell her father the whole story. She also says administrators said her father didn't want to speak to her. She felt forced to leave the school. So I became homeless. Tried looking for jobs. I didn't have a driver's license. Uh, all I had was a U.S. passport. I didn't want to sleep in downtown New Orleans. That's not something I had done. I always would take the trolley for a dollar and sleep in the Garden District because it just felt safer. And basically, I'm walking up Bourbon Street with a dollar. I'm like, well, I have enough to get into the Garden District but not back. So what do I do? And there are strippers all along Bourbon Street, you know, just hanging out, trying to get people to come inside. And I, I asked one of them, I'm like, can I ask you how much money you make? The doorman came running behind me. He goes, wait, 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 do you need a job? And I'm like, I, yeah, I need a job. I'm like, do you have like waitresses? <laughs> and then we went to the back where the offices were. There was like an adding machine and she was bundling money and she had a cigarette in her mouth. She's like, let me see your arms. <laughs> and so I went like this, cause I didn't know what she meant. And she started laughing. She's like, do you do heroin? I'm like, no. <laughs> 
And she goes, all right, be here tomorrow at five o'clock. Kat thought she'd actually been given a job as a waitress, but she was hired to dance. She did that for several months to survive. I'd always been angry that I had lost my life, that all my friends were gone. I didn't keep in touch with my friends. You know, I didn't go to weddings. I didn't see anyone. That part of me had died. That life was done. So I really just focused on what's next. 18 years would pass before Kat's father would find out the truth, something that shocked him. In a letter to Emma Willard, he said they did not tell me she had reported to them that she was raped, a felony the school did not refer to police, and that we also expected her to be safe and respected. That did not happen. As Kat struggled on the streets, Scott left Emma Willard. He was given a letter of recommendation for a new position at a private school in Connecticut. And that like gives me chills um, because that was an adult in the position of ensuring that children have an advocate for them. We left a big hole in the process, and that is the ability not to report. Our obligation is to fill it. Why are they still in business? Why, why do they still have a license as an educational institution? This is not something that anybody wants to face full on, but if you don't, then you're not fully committed to, to fixing problems. I took away that for a number of girls who were at Emma Willard at the time that they experienced something that a student should never ever have to experience or deal with and that it is our responsibility now at this school to make sure that it never happens again. This is the first time Emma Willard has spoken on camera and in depth about this. The school's misconduct goes back decades, beginning at least in the 1950s. According to a 127-page independent report released by Emma Willard, anonymous alumni acknowledged extraordinary insidious behavior on part of some of the male faculty, admitting that sex ran the school. A 1978 speech from then-principal Frances O'Connor outlines the shocking discovery. She says in part, I've learned that the desire to help young people and to give up oneself for them is replaced in some of our colleagues by the desire to use our students for personal pleasure and satisfaction. That report was released in 2017, nearly 20 years after Kat told Emma Willard. That's not an easy thing to look at, but you have to look at it. You have to be honest about it. We, our, our philosophy was we want to know everything. Leave no stone unturned. New York state law requires public schools to report sexual abuse. Within that law, a loophole exists. It is not mandatory for private schools to report sexual misconduct. No one told me what to do after your rape because I never thought I would be. Let's just forget about the teachers for a second. The people who work in the cafeterias are not mandatory reporters. The security guards are not mandatory reporters. The dorm parents, the people who make sure your children are tucked in bed and at study hall and where they need to be, are not mandatory reporters. We left a big hole in the process, and that is the ability not to report, our obligation is to fill it. John Brooks is a first-term senator from Long Island. Winning by less than 300 votes, he's putting it all on the line, making the loophole a priority. Everybody in Albany needs in their mind to think about what these kids are going through, and we have the ability to stop it. But Brooks' legislation has gone nowhere, never making it out of committee. How are they not at the same standard of reporting as a public school? And they're not. I don't know where that comes from, and it makes absolutely no sense to me. Why should they have the choice to not report a violent crime? That is a choice they are given. We as a society have really not accepted how broad a problem this is, how devastating it is. You know, we need to open up the doors, open up the windows, find out what's really going on, make sure everybody's reporting it. Why it's sitting? I don't know. I don't have a good answer for it, but we've got to fix it. While Brooks has been trying to fix the law, Emma Willard has been busy reevaluating. The current administration does not include anyone employed at the school when Kat was a student. In the past several months, 
they have met with experts and made resources more visible. We upped all of our trainings. Um, we took a look at best practices in policies and programming, um, and we implemented those changes on, on many different levels. We spend um, a number of lessons talking about healthy relationships, what are the signs of what a healthy relationship should look like, and when it's unhealthy, we talk about grooming, we talk about consent, so to make sure that they are aware um, of what is out there in the world. For the first time, we undertook self-defense classes. They've also taken it upon themselves. Every employee is now considered a mandatory reporter of suspected abuse. We bring in the Troy Police Department, we bring in Child Protective Services, we bring in industry experts, we do United Educators online training regularly and all of the time so that our every adult knows how to recognize the signs and better yet, how to report them. The school has also changed its code of conduct, creating a diagram on how to report crimes and make trainings mandatory. But Kat says there's much more that needs to be done. There's a Venn diagram where it says, if the rape happens off campus, call police. If the rape happens on campus, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And eventually it goes to the head of school and the head of school decides if police are called. And then they give you 10 pages outlining how they will perform their own investigation on campus. While the goal is always prevention, it's very important for every adult in your organization to understand and recognize the signs of sexual misconduct or, or abuse and to be able to know how and have the confidence to report them and who to report them to. Almost 20 years after her rape and with no bill passed, Kat is continuing to take things into her own hands. She's bought billboards and has literally taken her message for lawmakers to the skies. The plane was really sort of a desperate attempt to get the attention of senators that have heard about the Child Victims Act for 12 years now and have not made any movement to make that reality in New York state law. I think I'm able to talk about it because like it's way the hell over there. <laughs> like, um, I'm not putting myself in the position. That's not me, I am not there, I am in this room. We are the only people that can tell you what happens and how it felt and, and we're trying to have that conversation. And I think society's at a point now where it's more receptive. We needed them to be able to share their stories, um, which were incredibly painful. Um, and we wanted them to be able to speak with people who had their best interests in mind. I'm not gonna say that I'm fortunate, but if I'm capable, then I need to be delivering this message. Like, society needs to hear what kinds of things happen. Kat placed one of her billboards in South Hadley, Massachusetts, where Scott was living a normal life. As a result, he was forced to move and resign from the town's historical commission. Our attempts to locate and contact Scott have been unsuccessful. Kat has not been on Emma Willer property since she left in 1998, but she has looked over the gates to see the school that changed her life's direction. It was actually kind of sad because it really is beautiful. And for some reason, the thought in my mind was, you know, who used to put coal in the chimneys? Like who used to stoke the chimneys to keep all the girls warm? I think that it has brought together the community in a way that um, certainly we didn't expect this to, to come out. Um, it did um, and it galvanised the community together to say we need to recognise what has happened in our past and we need to support each other through some very, very challenging times and know that we will become stronger um, and even more committed to keeping the safety of our girls at the forefront of all of our work. Life is actually really good now. I'm in a relationship now I'm very happy with. My company that I own is doing really well. I'm starting to have friends again. I mean, there's a lot of things that I lost when, when I left Emma Willard. I don't know if you ever really can get over it. I think I'm using it in a way that is helpful. And I think that's the way it needs to be, is that it needs to be something useful.